So this talk is going to be uh, more about my own, um, not about my own research. My research has been in computational semantics, particularly lexical semantics. But it's going to be more about my experience in our evaluation of such systems. And there might be a lot of reasons why you'd be interested in why, why we want to look at um, carefully at how we evaluate these systems. Because you might be interested in running a task, or right? starting a new task to evaluate your own uh, systems. Or you might be interested in participating and you want to know um, the pros and cons of the different tasks before you start. The other reason is you might just be a consumer. You might be interested in looking at the results. And that's why I think it's really important to understand what those headline scores mean and what those data sets on which they're basing um, these, these tests and evaluations are. So um, that's going to be the, the main thrust of my, my talk. Okay, and as an outline of the talk, I'm going to start off, I realize there'll probably be a range of backgrounds in the audience. I'm going to give a quick background on computational semantics and the aims why we wanted to um, do evaluation, what, uh, what our aims were when we started this series of events. Okay. I've been involved as a participant from the start, so I was a um, PhD student when I first participated in um, 98 and felt very nervous about participating and was very greatly encouraged to participate, being told it doesn't matter if you're top or bottom, it's more about the participation. And I'm a firm believer of that. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about what I understood about the aims from the eyes of somebody who is participating from the back. But then I've gone on to organize tasks myself, talk about some of the aims, and then witness to uh, various other tasks that people have run. So the task started off firmly in um, a field called word sense disambiguation. So words have multiple meanings. And the idea is with a computational system, you want to uh, get the computer to realize, associate the right meaning with the right context so it knows uh, what the speaker is, is referring to at any given point. And uh, the sense of our series very firmly started with these word sense disambiguation tasks. But then subsequent to that, it's blossomed into a whole gamut of a wide variety of different tasks. And I'm going to cover just some of those. I'm going to, in this um, section, I'm going to cover, uh, give a, a classification, if you like. There's loads of different ways in which you could classify these tasks. But I'm going to be thinking particularly about whether they um, require a specific representation of semantics or whether they're completely agnostic about that representation. And I think that's quite important because if you have a specific, there's all sorts of pros and cons, all right? I want to show why I was interested in this because some systems are, um, are not um, firmly in any particular representation camp and we want to be able to, uh, or they, are, they have different representations and we want to be able to compare them fairly. So I'll talk about um, the whole variety of tasks and then, uh, then just uh, go into details of a few tasks, some lexical tasks, that's at the word level, and then some tasks on larger linguistic units. And then hopefully I'll summarize um, before you're all asleep. So um, the background in computational semantics, what we're interested in is uh, getting our computer models to ascribe meaning to linguistic units. And those linguistic units could be words, we're also interested in subwords. Um, we're interested then in building up our models for meaning of phrases, sentences, and discourses, so um, beyond the word level. What meaning do we ascribe? Well, how are we going to attach, associate meaning with the linguistic form? Well, to start with, Sensebar was very much interested in word senses as the fundamental unit. Uh, so a word like match can mean uh, matchstick, um, striking a match, or it can be the football match that many people have been watching over the last few weeks. Um, and there are other, other uh, meanings of match. We might also be interested in categories, for example, semantic relationships like bread is a food. Okay. 
we might be interested in different types of semantic relationships, but not just at one word level, but relationships between different words. So bread is a food, and also wheel is a part of a bus, so we have part of. We have a before relationship, a precedes temporal relationship with give birth and die. Or we have causal relationships, such as murder causes death. And then there are, there's a lot of re research, a big body of research, interested in building from the individual units a representation of meaning at a um, phrase or sentence level. And often that's done with a logical form. So producing uh, a, 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 for a representation of a sentence like, I give the dog a bone, the uh, predicates represent the verb, say give, which is often thought of as an event, and the arguments, the, the nouns, I, dog, and bone. And then the shared variables give the semantics of that sentence. So here, give has um, the first slot is occupied by I, which is then ascribed with a role, an underlying semantic role. So that's the agent of that sentence. And then the second argument, the uh, variable Y, which is shared by the predicate dog, that's um, given the semantic role recipient. And then bone is the theme of what is given, okay? And you would expect with a semantic relationship that if I, I said that sentence in a different way, I give uh, a bone to the dog, that I come out with the same semantic representation. So it should be canonical, it should be able to express the things we want. So we, um, there's a lot of work in semantics using these logical forms and other representations. We're also interested in idiomatic use. So if I say he gave them a run for their money, I really mean he gave them a challenge. There's nothing to do with running, okay? So we're interested in trying to spot cases where the, the individual words, you can't compose them into a, a greater meaning as you would do as the, the logical form would um, make you think, oh yes, you can just compose the, the meaning of the individual units and get the meaning of the sentence. So that breaks down in some cases, such as these idiomatic phrases. And then the question we're thinking about today is, okay, I've got a computational model of semantics. How should I measure success? So whenever you're doing the evaluation, um, typically you ask yourself, well, why this task? Why is it important? And in computational semantics, there's been two main reasons that we do a particular task. And we should always ask ourselves, in fact, we have right from the very start of Sensible, why this task, is this task actually useful for something? Is it useful for, and from an engineering perspective, for building an application? Or is it interesting from a scientific perspective? Does it help us model human language and linguistic behavior? Okay, and right from the very start, those questions have come up. So people have assumed that this task, word sense disambiguation, which I'll talk more, is valid, but there've been questions about its validity. So people have used these tasks um, to test, as one objective, to test if the task itself is viable. Another reason why we run these tasks is to measure success. Are we there yet? If the task is really easy, if all the systems are doing really well, then why bother? Why bother the doing the task anymore, coming up with new models? Um, if we're not fully successful, what counts as worthwhile keep going on this? You know, if we're getting uh, only 10% of things right, how good is that? How useful? You know, with no sharp side of improvement. Um, so it's to decide how successful we are, but also to compare systems. So often what you want to do, um, what people use these um, evaluation data sets are, is for saying, oh, my system's the best in the world. You know, look at, look at it, it's all bells and whits, scored top in the system. But actually what we might want to do is compare different systems. I'm going to stress that that's what the aim of Sensival was to be able to compare different systems, not to allow one system to take over necessarily. Yes, of course, it's useful to know what works best, but it's really important to know what works best when and have some sort of scientific approach to it. 
and find out also sometimes what doesn't work, what you would expect to work. Then there's a wide variety of measurements, and you'll see these used if you look at some of the Sensoval Semival literature in lots of subtly different ways. So you have to be a little bit careful. Often we talk about accuracy, how well did the system do? But then sometimes people are more precise about that, so they'll use terms precision and recall. And even these can be used slightly differently depending on the task. But precision normally means how much did I get right, right out of the things I tried? Okay, so you might say, all right, there's 100 sentences, I'm going to try 10 of them. Okay, and if you've got all 10 right, that's great. You did very well on precision, but you'll have done lower on recall. So recall measures how many things did I get right out of all the things that I should have marked up. Okay, and coverage is how much of the data could I cover. That might be interesting. Some systems might just fall down, not, be, not actually be able to cover the data. And then as opposed to kind of making a judgment, oh, I'm not so sure about that, I won't bother. Um, coverage might, you could also measure, well, could I, could I have a go at that one? Correlation is quite useful. When we're looking at um, ordinal measurements from humans, so if we're in interested in science of human behavior, human linguistic um, evidence, we might ask humans to make a judgment on a scale. We might say, well, say one to five what you think, how similar you think these two words are. And then what we sometimes do is use correlation. How well do our systems correlate with what the humans do? And in all, with all these metrics, what we need to do is see, well, what's the best we can expect? Okay, should we expect 100%? Is that realistic? If we give the same task to people and they can't do it, say they get 90% that they can do, then surely we shouldn't expect what does it mean if our computational systems then do better than the humans? What does that mean? Okay, a different question to if they do better than the best human, that's a slightly different question. Um, you know, which might, you know, there might be people who, who, who find some tasks easier or, or, or more hard. Um, the other question that we need to think about is what's the worst we should expect? Okay, so we should expect to beat random baseline, right? If I'm given three, two word senses for match, okay, if I'm just given the football match and the striking match, I should be able to get 50% correct of the time if, if the data is split 50-50, okay? There's an interesting question in language. Language is uh, hugely skewed. So the, some words occur lots of the time, in other words, very little. Most words are um, most words are very uncommon, and there's a few words that are used again and again. And the same with words meanings. So you'll get meanings that are much more frequent for any given word. Now, systems that don't know anything about um, those frequency differences, you might expect them to perform at random baseline, above the random baseline of, of just picking a sense at random. But um, for systems that use training data, that is supervised machine learning systems, where they're given a big batch of training data to learn from, so they're given marked up examples from machines, you would expect them to beat that first sense frequency. The, they, they've given the training data, you'd expect them to at least be able to do, pick the most likely, to learn from the training data what's the most likely sense. So we need all the time to think about the best and the worst. And then there's big questions about uh, what data. I mean, there's what data you test, because it makes huge differences. You know, are you going to keep all in the financial? Are you going to use newspaper text? Are you going to use Twitter? It makes a big difference to what results you can expect. There's also issues. One thing that we were very keen on in Sensible was to have uh, replicability. We want to build um, data sets that we run these evaluation challenges and expect people to do it in a, um, to a deadline. But afterwards, you want people to go on and be able to test their systems later on. Of course, they don't have quite the same constraints. It's a bit easier when you don't have deadlines on you. Nevertheless, we have to think carefully about availability and licenses. So if you, if you um, run a test on data that people can't get hold of, there won't be so much take up afterwards. Um, there's also the issue of how much overuse a particular data set has. 
So if everybody, at one t point in parsing, um, there was some uh, syntactic parses over the Wall Street Journal. So everybody was testing and evaluating on the Wall Street Journal. It was as though that was the only type of language that mattered. Okay, and so we, we need to be very careful that we don't overtune our systems for the one type of text. So now I'm going into the um, sense of R, which was the first um, set of series events, and then they um, started calling them semivar. So uh, um, word sense disambiguation is the the task that was um, has been going since um, for 40, 50 years where a, a word is um, labelled with a particular sense. The idea is you give a sentence like, um, douse the building in gasoline and struck a match, and people will hopefully be able to come up with the, the right meaning. And the system has to go up and look in an inventory somewhere. Um, and this is from WordNet. I don't know if you're familiar with WordNet. It's a free online resource and a lot of systems um, in English, but also in other languages, will use that. So they'll then uh, associate a given word in text with the, with the meaning. And sense of our was um, originated because uh, they'd had following discussions at a workshop, because basically there were nearly as many um, data sets, evaluation data sets for this task as there were people. Everybody published a paper. They said, oh, look, I've got this um, wonderful system. If you were very lucky, they'd actually done some evaluation. They'd picked up you know, a few words and marked up some text just by themselves, or we don't know who'd marked it up, and then tested their system. And there wasn't the um, capacity for sharing data sets as much, although I'm sure if you wrote to them, they would have shared it. But there wasn't so many uh, tests, um, systems being tested on the same data set. So that was w where we were at at 98. So the idea was, oh, it seems obvious now, to create a standard approach, a gold standard, if you like, um, to level the playing field, to make it fairer to compare systems. And the, um, there were choices made over data and sense inventories. Now, of course, those choices, as I'll show, will buy us some, you, you try and level the playing field, you can never level it completely. But the aim was, okay, well, we'll have everybody using the same data and the same sense inventory. And we'll take a measure of how gold that um, data is by getting humans to do the task and seeing how much they agree. So that's our, what's the best case scenario, see how well they can do at it. And they picked on the metrics that I mentioned earlier, precision and recall, the lots of other subtleties that we looked at. There's always going to be biases. So whenever you see the headline results, you have to realize there's those biases. But the idea was um, quite, quite different at that time and, and a great catalyst to research in this area by allowing that, those comparisons. Um, the methodology um, focused very much on the conditions. Um, so making sure everybody was able to download the data for the same amount of time, everybody had access to some trial data. They also gave training data. Everyone could use it, but some of us weren't using these supervised machine learning systems. We were building other types of systems. So you could or didn't have to use the training data and then the test data. Right from the very start, it's been running, Sensevar and Semivar been running in lots of different languages. Um, the, uh, the work I'm going to talk about on the whole is going to be English, but there are lots of other data sets in lots of other languages. And the aim was for inclusivity. Right from the very start, we didn't call it a competition. In fact, the, um, the, uh, one of the um, leading organizers, Adam Kilgariff, uh, said he specifically didn't want it to be called a competition on the grounds that people like me, PhD students who were just starting out, wouldn't feel concerned or worried about whatever our systems were or weren't doing. Okay? And that, I think, is very important. I, I do see it referred to as a competition quite frequently. I think in people's minds it's thought as a, a competition, but I'd like to persuade you that we shouldn't think of it as that. Um, there are big issues with sampling choices. So the way in which you sa sample data, because of this skew in language data, it's even more, it's always important how you sample your data. But because language data is so skewed, 
there's huge considerations with that. So initially, um, what was done, which is often done in um, word sense disambiguation, was they took a lexical sample. That is, they chose specific words and then d created some tags, got people to label up a set of uh, data which they sampled from corpora and then tested the systems on that. And then in the second sense file, three years later, they moved on to having an all words task where you mark up all the data in one document. So there's pros and cons of both. Of course, a lexical sample, you're free to choose harder cases, okay, or interesting cases. Okay, you still have the skew of the data because it depends how you sample the instances of those lexical items. For the all words task, you really are faced with the skew in the document. There'll be some words that will only be seen with one particular sense. You'll also have lots of trivial, easy cases, words with only one meaning. At the start, the um, sense inventory, they wanted to try and create a situation where none of us were biased too much. So they gave us an inventory, Hector, which none of us had been using okay, on, on that very grounds. But there were some issues with licenses. And they had to provide us, because most of us were work using WordNet, had to provide us with a mapping between um, WordNet and Hector. Now, a mapping provides some biases. You know, it, it might do a disservice to your system. It might actually help your system because it might push it more likely to the, the most common sense just because they're more likely to be mapped or more senses will be mapped to it. So there are pros and cons of these mappings, um, but there were lots of dilemmas, as I'll come on to, of which sense inventory we should be using. There was an interesting task in the second sense of all, that's... Um, the Japanese translation task. So there's this idea that you could come up with sense distinctions by looking at parallel data. So a word that's translated in multiple ways in another language, those translations could be used as the, um, as the senses. And there's been a lot of work in that. And that's interesting. Uh, it does depend very much which languages and how many languages you pick and whether you're interested in machine translation or something else. So the uh, methodology was very much hand labeling the data blind. So getting not obviously they could see the data. Um, so the annotators didn't know one another, didn't know what each other one another was putting. But then there was an adjudicator. They were comparing how what those what those verdicts were, and then an adjudicator decide what was the correct choice. And then we had this estimate um, of the upper bound, which was for WordNet senses was something like. I think it was about 78, it varies. So some tasks I've seen it slip way lower than that. It just depends um, on the inventory and, and uh, the choice of lexical items, of course. And then we had random uh, baselines and the most frequent, which I've mentioned before. So word sense disambiguation, hey, it sounds really great. And people, whenever they give word sense disambiguation talks, always come up with those um, nice, neat examples like match, and star, and plant, and you'll see them again and again. But um, in reality, so the uh, Adam Kilgareth, who was one of the um, uh, initial co-organizers of sense, well, he was um, concerned, in fact, his whole thesis was about the fact that words don't neatly partition into senses. So you get many, many words that are difficult because they have lots of related senses. So line is okay, a mark long rather than it is wide, but we also have a line of people. We could have a queue of people or we could have a row of people. We could have a row of suites. We could have a line of text, okay, or a column of text indeed. So all of these lines, we could have a telephone line, are all highly related. Where are we going to make the sense boundaries? Uh, moreover, you can get words like bar, where you have um, a, a bar of wood, then a bar you could think of as a counter when you go into the pub, and then a bar as in the pub. Okay, And you can see the relationship. Okay, I could argue that there's a relationship between the bar, slab of wood and the pub, but only via this um, counter if you like. So even, break, even trying to lump senses together, it's not straightforward. It's not an easy enterprise. You have words like child with um, the, the meanings offspring and young person. So I have a child. She just happens to have grown up. Okay, two children. But um, if I look at a sentence like, you fall in love or give birth to a child and suddenly you remember the miracle of existence. 
okay? Well, both the offspring sense, the, the, the fact that this is my child, and the young person are evoked there by that sentence. So, so although you can see the different senses and the different meanings, they can both occur at the same time. So many believed in um, sense of all and elsewhere that we uh, needed to actually go to a coarse-grained um, level of sense distinction for word sense disambiguation applications, and that would, that would solve all our problems. Of course, that makes it an easier task for humans, so the upper bound goes right up, agreement goes right up, and also, likewise, the system performance goes right up. It's random chance goes right up. It's a much easier task. But there are arguments on the other side that sometimes the subtle distinctions are important. So if I, um, uh, anyway, so uh, there's a question about how you um, divide a, a meaning up into senses. So for sense of our two, they decided, right, we'll do a coarse grain task. So they took a word like child and they divided it into senses. They said to people, right, can you, divide them up. We're not sure exactly how they did it, but this is what they came up with, because there wasn't any documentation about that time about how they did it. It's quite interesting. So the first, so these are the four senses of WordNet. We've got a young person, a, a, a child, uh, uh, below 18, a human offspring, okay, so my child, somebody's child, an immature person, and a member of a clan or tribe, like a descendant of Israel. And they marked up that the young person and an immature person should go together, and the human offspring and a clan, member of a clan like should go together. So like the youth versus descendant. So you can see, OK, that seems logical. But then if you look at translation of those, those, um, those instances, or you look at that sentence I just showed you on the previous slide, you see actually sense one and sense two are, should often be conflated. So there's questions about how you go about um, grouping meanings. Of course, for machine translation, it does make sense to use parallel corpora if you know what those, um, so called, what those languages you're going to be dealing with are and try and get the sense distinctions from that parallel data. But what about other applications? What about summarization? What about paraphrasing, monolingual applications, question answering? What about modeling what goes on um, with, in the human for word meaning? Because we clearly get puns of jokes. So we clearly manipulate ambiguity. Um, this morning, I passed the coffee. Uh, uh, there's a coffee trolley by as I get the train up to London, and it's the, the daily grind, right? So it's the, the, cof the grinding coffee and the um, daily grind to go up to London. So uh, it's clearly something we all recognize and, and um, engage with. So as well as this issue of what's the right sense inventory, which is this fundamental um, representation issue I want to talk about today, there were other issues. One is that um, supervised systems, that's the systems that were given the hand-labeled training data. This is just a chart of the results from Sensible 3, so that's the third evaluation we did with the all words data and for English, so it's just one evaluation. But there was a big pattern happening. So supervised systems were doing much better than unsupervised. Um, but they needed a large amount of hand-labeled data, and that's very costly to produce. It takes a lot of money to get people to produce it. And there's always new types of data, new types of text. You might be dealing with finance or biomedical. You want to go to a different language, you know, meaning changes. So it's a costly enterprise to start going down that route. The other thing to note is I mentioned the um, baseline of um, the first sense heuristic, just picking the first sense in WordNet. So these uh, orange and uh, yellow spikes on the left, that's, the, that's that baseline. That's just saying, hey, we'll just pick the first sense in, in um, WordNet. And these systems that use these quite complicated machine learning and lots and lots of training data, we're doing just a few percentage more than that. Okay, so the question is, is, is this good enough for all this effort? Is this really helping? Um, there's lots of other interesting questions that you could ask, well, is it good on some words and not others? There's lots of further analysis that you could do. It's also interesting to note further down, we see the unsupervised systems, and they seem to be quite good at precision. So 
they got some good spikes, so they're actually perhaps better, arguably better at picking out um, words that they're going to have a confidence. However, you must be really careful because when uh, you look at any data set, you need to know what that data is. And this was the all words task, which included those trivial cases, right? So those unsupervised systems could be picking, going more with the easier targets and certainly why they're going to throw away monosimus targets. Okay, so monosimus being just one meaning. So you, you do have to, they were doing some things that the supervised couldn't do. I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but um, you do have to interpret those, those results carefully. So at the end of the um, first sense bar, we had a, a panel discussion to decide, um, right, well, uh, what should we do now? There's this plateau of performance, and there was a feeling that the plateau was just reflecting the skew in the data, and we're not really learning what works well when, which should be our enterprise. There was a desire to demonstrate the utility that people were itching maybe for grant money, I don't know, but they wanted to make sure that word sense disambiguation was useful in some application on a very engineering perspective, because um, there'd always been the question about um, from Adam Kilgareth about the validity of word senses and what actually goes on with humans. Um, he's saying it's fairly arbitrary the way that word meanings are cut up in the dictionary. Uh, there's a desire also to encourage new ideas and new art tasks. And then in a subsequent panel, not actually at this panel, but the first semibar, there was also an interest in interoperability. So that is having different tasks that allow you to um, talk to one another, use annotations of the same items, okay? And I'll come back to that later. So now I'm going to go into the semibar tasks um, and talk about semantic representation. There's a whole range of different um, semival tasks, um, and I won't bother trying to go into all the details. I've already talked about these word sense disambiguation um, tasks because they were the main they were the uh, the main meat of sensival. But just at the end of sensival, there were starting to appear some other types of tasks, such as um, getting systems to mark up logical form that I showed you earlier and semantic roles. And then there's, uh, there's been a number of different threads. There are many more tasks than I'm showing you here. I'm just going to talk about uh, a few of them in what follows. I'm going to talk about the word sense induction task. So that was the idea. Well, if we're having trouble with um, deciding what's the right sense inventory, maybe we should get the computers to work out what the senses are. And then the question is how to evaluate that, those, okay? And that's quite a tricky um, issue. Uh, so, and I, I wasn't altogether happy with whether that had lev leveled the playing field for, um, for systems that don't use a sense inventory as a representation. So I uh, participated with, uh, I organized with uh, Roberto Navigli the lexical substitution, which I'm also going to talk about. And then I'm going to contrast relatively briefly, the, um, some tasks in this area which are using these formal semantic markup, like logical form semantic roles, where you have a specific representation, with tasks like uh, semantic textual similarity, where you're getting intuitive judgments from people. So uh, if you like my categorization of these tasks, then you could use um, many, many different uh, types of categorization. But mine is between tasks which require some level of linguistic markup by annotators. So they've got to have some sort of training in some sort of linguistic phenomena to mark it up like the word senses. They need the sense inventory and to know how to mark up, the, to be told how to mark up, how to find the best sense. They, um, word sense induction, I'd like to think, came under this intuitive judgments, right? But the way it's very tricky to evaluate, and, and I'll, as I show you, it actually falls just slightly between those camps, but more depending on the linguistic markup on which it's based, the, the way that it's been evaluated. The systems, of course, don't use those representations. Um, then there's logic form, which I'll also mention. Then we have um, more intuitive judgments where we ask people on a scale one to five, how similar are these words or how similar are these phrases? 
And then there's also applications. Now, there's been a, a great interest in uh, having, having the systems demonstrate that they're useful in applications. And there are some applications run as in, sem in Semival, although these tend to be in bite-sized chunks. So things like um, r ranking a set of answers to a question, that sort of task, rather than a full-blown question answering system. Okay. I'm going to mainly talk about a few tasks in the linguistic markup versus intuitive judgment um, camps, just so you can see the pros and cons. Not, uh, and I, I, um, I really do feel now uh, uh, more that there are pros and cons of both approaches. I'm not um, completely down one side or the other. So. Um, following on from word sense disambiguation, there was lots of different. There's lots of different ways of representing um, sense. Okay, the traditional way was to get an inventory, a sense inventory like WordNet, and say, okay, how does it? Where are the um, different senses? Where do they fall? What are the definitions? And use those. So um, we already talked about match. Another way is to get parallel data to look at um, to look at say. The, uh, a word and how it's translated into different translations. And you can also use machine translation then to mirror back to the original language and come out with groupings, if you like, of paraphrases as your sense definitions. Um, there's also an awful lot of work in word embeddings or originally in vector space models right from the start, from the 90s. So they have systems that will deduce that a number of words are similar because they tend to um, have the same context. So example, uh, game, tournament, team, match, all have watch as spectators in, in their context. Um, and then cigarette, lighter, match might be grouped together. And the idea is that you partition a word you uh, cluster its different meanings by virtue of the um, words that occur in its context and then use second order context to go to these vector space models. People have also used topic models um, uh, for finding uh, hidden topics that have assumed to generate the context and then at runtime decide which particular topic you think match this particular instance. Okay, and that's, we've had a lot of success with those. Um, and then this is how the word sense induction. So great, we've got lots of different ways of um, inducing meaning. How do we go about evaluating it? And what's happened in Semival, um, because clustering is very, very hard to evaluate, so rather than get people to just cluster the sentences, which would have been the most data up, that's what you're asking the humans to do, to label the data. They're getting the humans to label it with the word net senses, okay? And then using those senses, they're then inducing a human clustering, if you like, and then compare using that for a comparison. My, my point is not that it's wrong or right. I mean, obviously, it's it been a good way of comparing different types of representation, but it does, and there's been a graded task, which I really liked, which allows for soft clusters, so a sentence could belong to more than one sense. Nevertheless, they are fairly still rep uh, dependent on this representation of sense from WordNet. So uh, there's been other tasks. So the word sense induction task within the context of a, um, an application was um, based on using uh, retrieval um, queries and then the, uh, the uh, snippets, and the system would be asked to cluster those snippets. Okay. And uh, they, they did, a, in actual fact, use Wikipedia as a disambiguation page. So if you like, there's still an inventory going on there. Um, but certainly, it was a case that it wasn't biased towards anyone that had used Wikipedia sense inventory. The um, topic modeling performed the best. It was trained on Wikipedia, but not on the, on the data, not on that sense inventory. So there are efforts to get word sense induction and demonstrate it's useful for applications. Aside from that, we run this lexical substitution task. So my idea was very much that I wanted to be able to compare systems that weren't um, heavily on the camp of uh, any particular inventory or even a representation of sense. I wanted them to be able to, uh, to, be able to compare um, 
vector space models with systems that used the sense inventory. So we devised this task that they would, um, it's a paraphrasing task of a word in context. We ask the humans and then the computers to uh, substitute the word match with another word, okay? In this case, they use game, but they could use tournament, whatever they like. So it's an open-ended task. So that means agreements down. One other um, downside of this task is um, you obviously have to choose lexical items which are, have got substitutes. I mean, you can, there's lots of um, different ways of, of playing it. It also conflates two tasks, if you like. There's the finding the paraphrases and then there's matching them to the context. So we had to do quite a lot of analysis afterwards to see which systems were doing well, say, at coming up with a, a good range of paraphrases and which ones were doing a good job of mapping them to the context. Um, just to give you a flavor, this is just some of the data from the humans. So the uh, 10 sentences and the frequency of the different substitutes they gave for the word inspector, uh, investigator. And you can see the different meanings from the researcher, um, experimenter like many of us in the room are, um, to the police detective, okay? And you can see that in that some, some sentences were much more on the experimenter researcher uh, type of responses and other senses falling much down in more into the official officer type responses. But what's nice about this data, what I like, is you can see this gradation of meaning for the context. We then, uh, the, we also wanted a task that would be useful for applications and we believe that this would be quite useful for um, paraphrasing, for summarizing all sorts of uh, applications. And we then ran a cross-lingual lexical substitution task where the task was to come up with a translation of the word in context. So. Uh, solid here is replaced by fuerto, solido, uh, restante. Um, I hope my translations are right there. Um, so we, uh, the, we didn't, because everything is done without releasing the data ahead of time, we didn't tell the participants, but in actual fact, we used the same data that we'd use for our lexical substitution task as we did for the cross-lingual. Uh, and what uh, that allows us to do is this interoperability. It allows us to then, we went on and did further research on the clusters that came out of the paraphrases compared to the clusters that came out of the translations. Okay, so that's something I was talking about earlier about wanting interoperable tasks. So not necessarily always doing it on new data, but being able to have these tasks um, relate to one another. So then, um, I'm going on to tasks on larger linguistic units. So I spoke already about um, traditional logical forms where we have a sentence like Popeye said, I usually eat spinach. And the task, um, and this one was run at Sensible, was to mark up uh, the, the main uh, verbs and nouns as predicates with shared variables. And those shared variables um, show the relationships in the sentence. And then other tasks, so, um, so uh, we have say, for example, has, um, is an event, and we have x1 is the, uh, in the first role of the slot of the event, say, and the second one is the second event, which is eat, okay? And then uh, x1 is shared between the, the first role, it's the agent of say, and also of um, eat. And Semivar, we had uh, another task which was geared up for FrameNet, which is a big inventory of um, situational semantics, if you like. So all sorts of aspects about any uh, particular event like buy, sell, or um, uh, here we have say and eat, okay? The statement and ingestion semantic frames, and they're triggered by particular lexical units. So in this sentence, we've got um, say and eat, triggering the statement and ingestion frames. And those frames have, uh, frame nets uh, specified what sorts of participants we should look for. We should look for, for the statement uh, frame, we should look for the speaker and the message, okay? And ingestion, who's doing the ingesting and the ingestibles, okay, the spinach. Okay, and the task was to then mark up data. And there are other, Lots of other um, 
task which are run in Semival. So this is the abstract meaning representation and it's a parsing and generation task which uses a different system of semantic roles, which I, I won't go into the details for lack of time. And there's other related tasks. This is much more geared towards English, but there's other related tasks I see for next year already announced on cross-lingual semantic parsing, so coming up with markup like this. However, that said, in contrast, we want to maybe be able to compare systems that are more data up, that are, that are um, t sure you can get systems to learn with training data, or you could engineer, you can build systems to produce FrameNet style annotations. But you might also want to look at systems that have all sorts of other um, architectures on a level playing field. So one thing following on from, the, um, uh, from other similarity work was to try and get um, judgments from humans and then from systems on the grounds of semantic similarity. So for example, demeanor similar to nonverbal behavior. And also detecting, um, so they just had to say yes or no, they were similar. Detecting non-composition. So uh, it may go off in your face, the far work, or the musical backing is not in your face like some of today's recordings. So there to see that the second one is slightly opaque. It's, uh, you can't just get the meaning from the individual words. So uh, as well as that, we had the semantic textual similarity task. So these were judgments of one to five of how similar two text fragments were. They were taking, uh, it's hopefully very useful for applications. They took data from a variety of domains, including, for example, a plagiarism corpus or um, image descriptions where several people have described the same image. Okay, so it's natural data and they run a monolingual and then a cross-lingual task where you're comparing, say, an English text fragment with a Spanish. Okay. And uh, these are the guidelines. I won't go into details because of lack of time, but they, uh, they give you a couple of sentences and the subjects would then say, hopefully they flew out of the nest in groups, they flew into the nest together. These two sentences are not equivalent, but they share some details. And the idea is you can then test these systems on this task and it doesn't matter what architecture. We're not requiring any specific types of representation. One of the problems, as with the lexical substitution, is you have to do a little bit more analysis to see what's going on. And I think for lexical substitution, it was relatively simple. We could look at whether they were generating the paraphrases or matching them to the context. But here, we have a problem with, well, how are these text fragments similar? How do we know what the systems or the people, what their judgments have been based on? So they ran an interpretable semantic similarity task uh, where they asked people to say, well, which parts of the sentence are similar? And then are they more specific or are they equivalent? And do that as well as providing your similarity score. So hopefully they say, well, I think 12 and 10 are, uh, that's why I think it's similar. Um, they're both being killed and I'd say they're, they're similar, they're not the same, okay? And in Pakistan versus in North Pakistan, in Pakistan is more general. The textual entailment tasks were running alongside um, these semantic textual similarity tasks. Um, and they were based on going from a premise to a hypothesis. So decide um, whether, uh, whether the... Uh, hypothesis is entailed by the premise. So a man reads the paper in a bar with green lighting, the subjects would be told, can you generate, make up a sentence that you think is entailed, okay? And one that's neutral and one that contradicts. So the man is inside can be entailed from that sentence. But one issue is that these are generated by human beings being given this task. So there's this question, well, how natural is, is that what goes on? You can see why they're doing it to, to um, make it uh, feasible and to balance the data sets. So another task that I want to tell you about called SICK, sorry about that, but they, um, the idea was to aim it at um, systems that built um, meaning compositionally from individual units. 
And they wanted to focus on these vector space, these embedding models that didn't have any particular representation. Any other system could participate, but they really wanted to be able to test these systems. They had a semantic relatedness, so that's like the uh, similarity uh, test, one to five, and they had an entailment task. So um, uh, is it entailed or contradicting or neutral? And they ruled out um, all sorts of background knowledge. So they didn't expect you to deal with opaque texts. They didn't expect you to deal with the fact that Trump is the president of America or any sort of background, which a lot of the textual entailment data sets and the uh, semantic textual similarity data sets had in them. Um, but focus on linguistic issues like negation and um, active passive sentences. What, this was great. And they certainly produced a very useful data set one downside is that they found that systems exploited ad hoc features. So very simple things like looking for negation and looking for antonyms could give you like the high 80s, a high 80s score on spotting contradiction. Okay, so now I'm going to summarize, if you please, please do, you'll definitely get out, um, with, uh, on what I said, um, the pros and cons of these different approaches. Semantics is covered. It's, it's not like grammatical form or phonetics or something of uh, phonological form. So it's not so easy to decide what's right and what's wrong. So evaluating it for that very reason is quite tricky. We can use standard representations like WordNet or FrameNet frames or a particular type of um, definition of semantic roles. Or we can say we're completely theory neutral and have um, similarity judgments or yes-no decisions or paraphrases. There's pros and cons. The, why I like representation-independent um, approaches is it allows comparison of completely different approaches. There's minimal guidelines given to annotators, so you don't feel you're biasing them with some um, theory. You're just getting them to make quite intuitive judgments. And they've been shown to be quite useful, some of these tasks for ongoing for applications. However, that said, you do need to be very careful of the data to actually look under the hood and see where the faults lie, perhaps more so than with the um, standard representations. Representations um, also, rather than saying, oh, you know, that they're, they're biased and, um, and they uh, decide to carve up meaning in one particular way and that might not be the right way, they also provide a lot of useful other information. So WordNet provides all sorts of semantic relationships that people are still using for lots of different applications. So they are useful resources and um, merit mention for that. FrameNet, for example, allows um, lots of inferences. So if we take, say, the frame theft, okay, there's a, a participant in that, whoever's done the stealing, and we can learn that they've also participated in the getting. They've got something, and they'll probably have uh, participated. They'll be um, a suspect under the crime scenario as well. So we can make, and they'll be a victim as well of the theft. So we can make various inferences. So these resources can be very useful as well. It would be great if, if the machines could just do this all up, bottom up, but they're not there yet. So summing up, pros and cons for representation dependence, there's uh, a danger of being biased to that particular theory, um, costly to produce the annotations. On the plus side, they do allow hooks into other semantic resources okay, and provide all sorts of other information. On the representation independent tasks like the lexical substitution and the um, similarity judgments, they allow a fairer comparison, if you will, of different approaches. And they're relatively easier to elicit. We can make them crowdsourcing tasks, so they're much easier to get data for. Uh, but interpretation does require very careful scrutiny. As, as I say, they could be all sorts of easy triggers to getting to be able to mimic that behavior. And one thing I would add is when you look at human agreements, so we think, oh, well, we want uh, humans to agree a lot of the time. We want to know the task is solid. But on some open-ended tasks like the paraphrasing task, it will be harder to get agreement because by its very nature, it's open-ended. People can come up with different words to paraphrase. Um, I think it's 
what I would plug for is not to call Sensoval Semival a competition, but also to allow possibilities of different types of annotation on the same data so we can do different sorts of research afterwards. Of course, that doesn't always, you have to not let people know which data set you're going to be using before you use it if you want to make things as fair as possible. But it does make ongoing research very interesting and useful without over-engineering. Let's not all go back to the Wall Street Journal. So, um, I mean, it's great, but there's other, other bodies of text as well. So finally, um, Semival and Sensival offer a lot of data sets, and you can go to their sites and pick up the data now and look at any of it. Um, so it's great for replicability. You can try and recreate some of those models. Many people release their models, so you can actually try and recreate their results. Um, bear in mind the tasks are always easier without deadlines, without you know, knowing you've only got a week to do it. Um, the importance of evaluating to compare and learn rather than bragging rights or who came top. That's the one thing that I'd like to keep pushing. Um, but I think a, a lot of people are on that camp. So. And then just watch for bias. When you read the headline scores, however, whether you're a task participant or whether you're an organizer or whether you're just somebody who wants to see, well, how well do these systems do on these tasks? Just watch for bias in data sets because they can make huge differences. And looking at a variety of different tasks really helps. Okay, thank you for listening and having me up here. <laughs>